Pastor John called me and said, could I fill in? I said, absolutely, I would love to. And here I am. The only thing, I have to apologize because the service started at 1045. Now, where I got that, I don't have a clue. So that's why I was pressing a little bit on the time. And I'm so sorry. So just relax, take a deep breath. Everything will just be fine. Take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 29. And we're going to begin reading in verse number 10. And I would just imagine that these are some of your life verses. Some of you have claimed especially one of these verses for your life, and you refer to it constantly. And it's a great verse. And we're going to share today, I sure could use a little good news. I sure could use a little good news. Some of you are old enough to remember Ann Murray's song to that title, A Little Good News. And she had an itinerary or a litany of bad things that were happening in the news every day. And then she, in her song, referred to the fact that today she would love to have a day where there was just good news and no bad news. Well, I'm just about fed up with all the bad news. I mean, we hear it everywhere we go. Everything we read, everything we see tends to want to bring us down and take away our joy and our hope. Well, I've got some good news for you today found in Jeremiah chapter 29, beginning in verse number 10. Let's read through verse 14. For thus says the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished, now we need to underscore that, at Babylon I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return back to your homeland or back to your place of promise. For I know the thoughts that I have toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, says the Lord. And I'll turn away your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you again unto this place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. So we have a glorious promise. And let's ask the Lord to bless the preaching of his word just like he has every other part of this service today. Father, I do thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here to share the good news the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and the good news of your word. I pray today that hearts might be open to receive this good news and that there might be joy where there has been sadness and there might have been peace where there has been anxiety, that there might be salvation, Lord, where there has been a lostness and a, and a desire to know you. May this be the day that we receive this good news. Thank you for your word. Bless it to us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I think that uh, as we look at the passage before us today, we have to begin with some bad news. Now, it's just a little bad news, but it's, it's bad news, and that is Israel had become so rebellious, you'll remember, that God had to deal with her in a very serious, severe manner. She had a history of being rebellious and obstinate, stiff-necked and, and hard-hearted, and so God had to deal with her. He had tried in so many loving ways to get her attention. You know, that's the way God is, isn't he? He tries to deal with us, first of all, by just pouring out blessing and blessing and blessing. And if we don't take time to give him glory for those blessings or we rebel in spite of those blessings, God will take away some of those blessings. And then if we still will not respond, God will deal with us accordingly, especially if we are the children of God. Amen. Everybody, how many knows that the chastening of the Lord is not pleasant? But it is so good for us when God shows his love by correcting and by disciplining us. Well, what God did to Israel was he called the Babylonians, that anti-God group of people that were so cruel and bloodthirsty, he called the Babylonians to come in and to take Israel captive. Now look at this. Here's where our bad news is. That for 70 years, Israel was going to be under the bondage of Babylonia. King Nebuchadnezzar and all of his cohorts would rule and reign over Israel. The problem is it was such a treacherous and terrible time for Israel. You know, we have a whole lot of uh, news today about speaking in tongues in the church. And it's been so divisive. And we're not going to talk about tongues. But let me just give you 
where it comes from in the Bible. Speaking in tongues comes from the punishment and judgment of God upon Israel. You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about this. When they went into captivity because God spoke to them through the Hebrew tongue of their prophets and they did not hear the message, they did not believe it, they did not respond to it, God sent them people whose language they could not understand. And the Babylonians would give the Israelites a command. The Israelites didn't know what they were asking them to do, and so the Babylonians would just knock them upside the head and treat them cruelly and batter them and beat them. And they were un in a land where they did not know the language, and therefore that tongue was foreign to them, and it was even more punishment. And it was a sign that because they did not believe God's voice as he spoke to them clearly, he would give them punishment for their rebellion. Now let me just tell you, that's a message here for somebody today. God is speaking to somebody clearly today, and you need to hear his voice. You need to heed that clear message of God so that your heart and life can be in line with what he, is, what he wants for you today. If God's speaking to your heart today, do not harden your heart as in the days of the children of Israel, but open your heart to the message of God's word. And so now, that's the bad news. Here's the good news, and I want to share it with you as we find it in this passage. Number one, even though our future may be uncertain, it is sure. We have a very sure future as the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I get a witness? God has already established our end from our beginnings. God has already set up a standard that will not be changed no matter what. Listen, the Bible says the winds of hell may blow against his church, but she'll stand strong and she'll endure those winds that the devil would blow against us. He wants for us evil. He desires to break us and to cause our voice to be silent. But we will not be silent. We'll stand up and raise the banner of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, all over this world, listen folks, all over this world where there has been persecution against the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, she is growing mightily by the hundreds, by the thousands, by the millions across the world. You know, the Sudan and China are off limits. You know, you can't be a Christian in China. You know that? You can't preach the gospel in China. You know that? But guess where the gospel is being so received that the revival is breaking out that has not been matched in many, many, many years? In China, the Sudan, hundreds of thousands, millions of people are coming to Christ in those closed countries. Give glory to God. Praise his name. So let the devil blow. Let the winds blow. Let evil come. Listen, the church will not be defeated or conquered we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. So our future is very sure. Number two, though, even though our future is unknown, we don't know what tomorrow holds, do we? It is secure because our future is in who? The Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, listen, he is still on the throne. Did you hear that? The Lord Jesus hadn't given up his reign. He hadn't given up his rule. And oh, by the way, none of this stuff going on today has caught him by surprise. He knows exactly what's happening. And look at this. Even those bad things that are happening to the world today, the Bible says in Romans 8, 28, and 29 that God is able even to make that into good things for his people. That God is able to cause all things to work for the good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And so today I have great news for you and that our future is sure and our future is secured because it's secured by what Jesus Christ did on the cross when he went to the grave and was raised again that made it all complete folks he said it is finished and that means it's done and it will be done just according to how he wants it to be done and then even though our future is constantly changing it is really changeless you know you heard that saying the more things change the more they stay the same you know folks let me tell you something the same needs people had 100 years ago are the same needs they have today. People are struggling with the very same addictions, the same problems, the same fears, the same worries, the same illnesses. Everybody still needs the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and the need to hear the word of God. And so we understand today that we, have, we are not like it was back in the 50s. You understand? But then there are so many things that are just like it was back in the 50s. 
And we need to be able to stand before the people in our modern day and share with them the old time religion and the old time gospel because it still works, folks. It will still do the job that God wants it to do. So with that, let me come to some real good news and share with you four, five, six, or seven things from this passage that will bless your heart, I pray, and that you might want to make this your prayer as you begin every day. And you might want to take one of them a day. I think I'll give you five or six, but you could go on and find seven and do one for every day of the week. Just pray this prayer and thank God for this good news, for these many blessings. The first thing that uh, I want you to see out of our passage in J Jeremiah chapter 29 is that Israel and us has an inheritance that will never be depleted. An inheritance that will never be depleted. Have you seen that bumper sticker that by the, on the back of the card that says, I'm spending my kids' inheritance? Which means they're enjoying it, living it up, not worried about leaving anything to the kids. Well, see, the thing about it is you can't deplete God's inheritance for his children. You can't ever spend it and never, never worry about whether it's going to be there or not when you need it. Now, how do I know that? Well, if you'll look in verses 5 and 6 of uh, chapter 29, you'll see where God told Jeremiah to tell the people to build houses and dwell in them and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them, take you wives and beget sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters that you may be increased there and not diminished. Now let, that's talking about time spent in Babylon. They were to build houses and to put down roots and to invest in their life because God was not through with them yet. He was going to bring them out with a strong hand and there would be a multiplied number of people because of God's rich promise to Israel that she would always be his people and she would always be the apple of his eye. So let me tell you, friend, and I know a lot of us worry about that. We worry about, have I used up God's grace? Have I prayed to, to him too many times for forgiveness of sins and will one day God say to me, no, you've sinned too much now? And you can never be saved again, or if you've, you once were saved, now you've blown it and you've lost it. Friend, let me tell you, our inheritance is sure and secure because of what Christ has done for us. Amen. He has bought us eternal salvation, and that will never be depleted. You'll never use up God's grace. Amen. He says it will be continually and constantly applied and given and offered to us. And so I'm living today because of God's grace, as Brother Eddie commented and testified. It's all because of God's grace that we're here. And that grace will be strong when I'm 20 years old, when I'm 50 years old. If I live to be 150 years old, God's grace will still abound and it will still be sufficient. Hebrews chapter 9, 15 is a good New Testament passage. And 1 Peter 1, 3 and 5 is another good parallel to this promise that was made in the Old Testament. But number two, I about gave my thunder away there, but number two, in this passage, we have grace that can never be diminished. The grace of God can never be diminished. Now, I want you to understand who we're talking about here in, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 29. We're talking about Israel. Now, let me just tell you this. If you and I were the Lord, Israel would not be in existence today. She would have been wiped out many, many, many eons ago because of her rebellion. But did you know God is a God of love? Have you, have you learned that yet? That when God looked at Israel, he looked at her not with the eyes only of an owner. He didn't look at her only in the eyes of a master. God looked at her with the eyes of love and grace and mercy. And as many times as she fell, and as many times as she spent at those foreign altars worshiping strange gods, and as those times that she offered her children in sacrifice to these strange gods, God's love was still poured out and motivated toward Israel. Friend, I don't understand that kind of grace. Do you? Now let's just think of your life and mine and think about this matter of God's grace. Now let's be honest. Let's get real. You know, everybody wants to get real today, so let's get real, all right? How many of you think, now I don't, I don't see your hands. I just want to make a mental note of this, all right? How many of you think you sin about one time a day? Let me see your hand. All right, thank you all for being honest. How many of you think you might sin more than one time a day? Oh, well, now, 
Now, we are getting real now. Okay, most of y'all are about, uh, maybe some of you are a little younger than I am, but uh, let's say that we're 50 years old. We'll just cut a median age here. At 50 years old, and let's say that in those 50 years, I have sinned once a day. Hello? Now, let me tell you, I have sinned more probably than once a day. You understand what I'm saying? Anybody got a picture here of what I'm trying to get at? Boy, God's grace is amazing. Isn't it? To think when the Bible says that his grace covers a multitude of sins, well, let me tell you, we got a multitude of sins right in his room. And when you consider the sins of the whole world, God's grace. Let me ask you a question. When is God's grace going to be run out on you? Well, friend, if it hadn't run out so far, it is not going to run out. God's grace cannot be diminished. Let me tell you, my friend, those of you, now i got friends just like this that have been Christians a long, long time. You don't need to worry about performing to please God. You don't need about doing certain things to let God know that you love him and that you want him to love you because you do those things. Listen, God doesn't deal with us because of our performance. He deals with us because of the covenant he made with the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross to be our Savior and to be our Redeemer. Amen. Christ did for something we could not do for ourselves. And bringing to us the grace of God, then that grace will bear us all the way through, folks. I had a very dear friend. I played golf with him once a week for about, I don't know, 13, 12 or 13 years. I was away, and when I came back, I heard that Sam had gotten sick. And that really, I didn't, you know, I'm thinking, well, he's a little older and he's sick. He'll be okay. He went into the hospital. And the doctors were giving him a very bad prognosis. I'm thinking, what in the world's going on? So when, I, when he went to the hospital, I went in and talked to him. And I said, Sam, what's going on? He said, they don't know what's wrong, but I'm very, very sick. And they don't expect me to make it. And I said, you've got to be kidding. And he said, no, they're very serious. And eventually, I asked Sam in our visit, whether it was that visit or one pre after that visit, I said, Sam, what, what can I do for you? He took my hand. He said, Preacher, pastor, I want you to make sure I've done it right. I said, what are you talking about, Sam? He said, I want to make sure that when I come to death that I'm going to be in heaven. And I said, well, Sam, and I took my Bible and I said, yes, let's do that. And we went over it, how Christ died for us, sinners that we are, how Christ loved us so much that he gave, how God loved us so much he gave his son, that if we'll believe in him, we shall not perish but have everlasting life. And that if we put our faith in him, that faith will secure us in heaven. And I said, Sam, have you done that? Do you believe Christ lives? And he, a big smile came on his face and he says, yes, pastor, I, I believe. I just want to be sure. Friend, I'm telling you, and I'm so happy to be able to go to a deathbed like that. I had one in the hospital the other, other day. First thing the man says to me in tears is, I want to go to heaven. And I was happy to share a way that he could go to heaven and give him the, the, the security that he so longed for in his last days of life. Friend, let me tell you, God's grace will be there with you on your deathbed. Amen. It'll be there with you in the sick bed. It'll be there with you in the good times and the bad times. Friend, let me tell you, that's some good news today. God will never leave us nor forsake us. The uh, third thing I want to leave to you today, now, so you can thank God for his grace every morning. Amen? Thank God for that glorious inheritance. Amen? And then let's thank God for hope because here it is in verse 14. Look at this. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29, I'll be found of you, says the Lord. I'll turn away your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, and I will bring you back again. God has given to us a hope that will never be disappointed. A hope that will never be disappointed. You know, as a child, I was disappointed a lot. I had an older brother named Gene that I loved and still love. He has gone to be with the Lord now, but I loved him. But there was only one thing wrong with, with Brother Gene. You couldn't always trust what he said. Now, as a 10-year-old, as an adult, we learned that about people. I mean, we learned you can't trust what Joe says or Mary says because it may or may not happen. But as a 10-year-old, you trust what people tell you. And I can't tell you the number of times that Gene said, I'll be by Saturday morning to pick you up and we'll go fishing. And I got up full of hope excitement of what that day is going to bring. Daylight came, no gene. 
Seven o'clock came, no gene. Eight o'clock, nine o'clock. Guess what happened to my hope? Now, you know, a kid is a kid. Now, you know a kid is a kid. Two Saturdays, he said, oh, I'm sorry, Dennis, I didn't make it. Denny, he called me Denny. I'm sorry, Denny, I couldn't make it, but we'll do it this Saturday. So what happened? Boy, the hope scale went up, didn't it? And guess what happened on Saturday morning? Boy, if God was like that, wouldn't we be of all people most miserable? If we had our hope in something God said and then all of a sudden he just didn't come through with it? If he made us a promise and, and it was no good, can you imagine? How many of you'd want a God like that? Well, I didn't want a brother like that either, but I mean I had one. No, we can trust God that when God tells us something, we can know that it is true. It's money in the bank. Better than money in the bank, folks. It's by God's own hand. I heard a story one time of an orphanage to where on the, on the glass of the orphanage out the front side of the building that there was always hand prints, fingerprints, and nose prints and mouth prints on the glass. And one of the missionaries asked, what's that about? And they said, well, every time somebody comes up to the orphanage, a visitor drives a car up, all the kids rush to that window looking out, seeing if that will be the mom and daddy that will adopt them for the future living in hope that somebody will come and rescue them. Friend, I have good news for you. God's word is sure. He told Israel that I'll bring you back to this glorious land and fulfill every promise I've ever made. And friend, he has told you and me that there is not one word, Jesus said, not one word, not one jot or tittle will ever be changed from this word unless it first be fulfilled. So there's your hope, friend. Don't get your hope out of the stock market. Don't get your hope out of the newspaper. Don't get your hope on TV, on the news channels. You get your hope out of this word, and you'll never be disappointed. That hope is eternal. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18 and 19. And then Colossians number 120 says, 127 says, He has given us a living hope. We'll never die. Hope. I wake up every morning with hope, don't you? I call my little dog hopeful because he's always hopeful somebody's got a treat to give him or something to eat. So listen, if I get up from my couch, I don't care what time it is, I may have just fed him. But if I get up from my couch and head to the kitchen, guess who's going to be with me? <laughs> hopeful. It's not his name, but he, Zoomer is his name, but he's right there every time with look in his eyes to me saying, what you got for me? And you know, <laughs> You know how us pet parents are, don't you? It's hard not to give them something, isn't it? Now, he's going to be this big around before he's through, but it's so hard not to say, okay, son, come on. Don't want to dash that hope. Well, listen, God, listen, folks, God is so generous with us, and he has made such glorious promises. Listen, now, you and I couldn't keep those promises, but God is able. Not only is he able, he's willing, and he will perform his good word. That's good news, isn't it? Amen. Praise the Lord. Next, let's go on. We've got to hurry. Number four is, we have a peace that cannot be disturbed. Look at verse number seven. And seek peace in a Babylonian city. Now, come on. How many of us can do that? Seek peace for your enemies. Because as they live in peace, then you will live in peace. And so what God has given us as a command is try, strive to be at peace with all men. And then 1 Peter tells us that he also gives us peace that will last forever. Peace. What peace means, now folks listen, now this is what we need to understand. Because what many, folk, many people think peace is the absence of any conflict. It's not that. There will always be conflict. But in the midst of the conflict, in the midst of the storm, we have peace. We are in the shelter of the almighty arms of God. And he will hold us through those times. And listen, sometimes God is so gracious that he will indeed, as that contemporary Christian song says, that sometimes God will indeed take the storm away. And don't we praise God when he does that? You know, you go to the doctor and they have a, a, a cancer report or a terrible report and they don't offer much hope. And then all of a sudden, a day later, they call you and say, wait a minute, we've made a mistake. Those were not the correct findings, and you do not have these. And we go, oh, gracious me. And during that hour or that day that we were worrying, our hope and our faith, 
our peace was just abandoned us. But then we are again ready for that good news, the peace to come. Well, friend, let me tell you what. It doesn't matter. Sometimes God does that. He takes away that storm, that area, that problem, that, that conflict, that res- relationship problem. Whatever it is, God solves that. And we are so thankful and we praise him. Listen, I've met many, many people who God didn't take the storm away. But that he changed them. He changed them in the storm. So that they were able to abide and to remain hopeful and to remain faithful. And to give God glory for whatever happens. And so that God would be honored and they would use the John the Baptist slogan that he must increase and I must decrease. But they lived with him and loved him no matter what life threw at them or dealt to them. We have a peace that cannot be disturbed. Friend, let me tell you, the only time we lose our peace is when we give it away. Are you with me? Nobody can take it from you. you got to give it up. And i got news for you. Let's don't give it up. Where are we without our peace? We are nothing but a nervous ball of wrecks and nerves. And we can't ever offer a word of hope or a word of encouragement to others because we're so wrapped up in our own troubles and our own woes and our own worries. That's not what God wants for us, folks. Go ahead. Pray for peace of your enemies. And as they get peace, you'll get peace. And you'll live in that peace. Number five, we have a joy that will never be disheartened. John chapter 15, 11 tells us that Jesus is our joy. And we have a promise that God will give us joy. Because listen, when Israel came back into the land, what a joyous occasion that was. When they came into the land rejoicing, able to worship God again and to see the, the uh, beautiful land that God had given them and fulfill his promise. When they were set free from captivity, there was a joy in the camp that was spread throughout the land and everybody heard about it. Now I'm telling you today, and it's not only today, it's been a while, but one of the greatest missing parts of a Christian church today anymore is joy. Joy. Where is our joy? Our joy is not in circumstances, not in surroundings. Our joy doesn't come because of this or that. It comes because of Christ, and he is constant. I appreciate so much today the banter and the joy as you shared in the beginning of your service. The laughter, people laughing. You know, I've been in churches, and I'm not telling you a story here. I've been in churches where something funny would be happening, and people would start laughing, so they had not laughed in so long, they began coughing, having a coughing fit. You know what I'm talking about? That's the kind of joy that we seem to be missing in the church today. In Christian lives, when's the last time you just goofed until you coughed and almost passed out? <laughs> hey, that's be pretty good for you, wouldn't it, huh? You see what I'm saying, though, don't you? Laughter is the medicine of the soul, folks. And our God is a God of joy. A God of joy. So don't be afraid sometimes just to let yourself go. Raise your head back and just laugh to the glory of God. Now, as we understand that, this is joy unspeakable and full of glory because of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not something that's going to pass away. This is a deep-seated contentment and joy that I have. But every once in a while, listen, joy has got to bubble up to the surface and get out. You can't hold that in there all along. It'll hurt you, okay? You got to get it out so that you can honor God with the praise of our lips and the praise of our life. And then I'm through when I say. Now, look at this. I'm going to pray this Monday. I'm going to pray. Thank you, Lord, for my inheritance. Amen? Amen? Thank you for my grace that's been extended to me again, afresh and anew, will never run out. You'll never stop loving me. I'll never mess up to the point to where you're going to turn your back on me. God, thank you so much. Where would I be without that grace? Thank you, God, for my hope. Where's my hope? My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Amen? And my Lord Jesus is holding there in check for me. Thank you for my peace. In the shelter of the storm, you're my peace. Thank you, Lord, for my joy. Well, that's a great day of prayer, isn't it? That's great five days of prayer. And then on the last day, here's what I want you to pray. Thank you for salvation that will never be disapproved. 
Hebrews chapter 5 verse 9 tells us that he is the author of our salvation. What that means is, is that you and I didn't think this up. Man hadn't come to a great idea, this is how we're going to go to heaven. God is the author of our salvation. And here's what God said. And by the way, you know God is sovereign. And what that means is God can do anything he wants to, anytime he wants to. And hadn't God explained to anybody else why he did it. Some of us need to hear that today. God is sovereign. He does what he wants. But now here's the, here's the way we can accept that in our human logic. God is always good and kind and loving. And so God is always going to do the right thing. But God, when he, when he makes a statement and when he does things, he is the sovereign God. And here's what he said. I am going to make a covenant with my son. That he will go to the cross and die for the sins of the entire world. Now in God's heart and in God's mind, in the Lord Jesus' heart and mind, in the Holy Spirit's heart and mind, that took place way back yonder before the world was ever established. Before you and I were ever even created, that took place in the eons of eternity when God said in Christ, everyone who believes in you will be forgiven of their sins and have everlasting life. Now let me ask you a question. What is everlasting life? <laughs> Let's say life everlasting. Now, is that hard to get? So let me ask you another question. So if life doesn't last, is that everlasting life? See, y'all are smarter than you look. <laughs> yes, you are. Say, so here, get that. Get that in your mind, in your heart. God doesn't offer you something, give you something, and then take it back from you. That is not everlasting life. John 3.16 says they shall have everlasting life. And just in case you missed it, he goes on to say, they shall never perish. That's good news, folks. Because listen, Adrian Rogers, who was one of the finest and still is one of the finest preachers, he's long gone to glory. But his radio programs are still on the air, and you can get his sermons, and the work of uh, Love Worth Finding is active just as much as it ever was. But he said this, and I love Adrian Rogers. I think he's the next man of God to Peter. I'm telling you, he's a, he's a man I love and who has lived the life of such credibility to God in his faith. But he said this. Now listen. Adrian Rogers said. I would not trust the best 15 minutes I've ever lived to get me to heaven. And friend I would not either. And you better not either. Because your good living is not going to cut it when it comes to the end of the time. God has made a plan and a covenant with you and with me. With everyone. That there is one way. John 14, 6. Jesus said I am the way. The truth and the life. Now look at this. No one. Well, what, that doesn't mean me though, does it? Now let's go back again. What does no one mean? No one. So that would include everybody. So as we understand that, what God has said is no man or woman comes to the Father except through me. Friend, it, it don't get any clearer than that does it but I got good news to tell you Christ today is still in the saving redeeming business we're hearing of people being saved all the time around this world in the, and we watch our we follow certain pastors and churches on Facebook and what a joy to see them baptize people after people after people coming to faith in Christ because let me tell you God's plan of salvation is still in effect he will save us to the uttermost, those who have been in the guttermost, he will save us for his glory and for his honor. Though I have, I have such great news today, friend. You know, my inheritance is settled, my joy, my peace. Everything that I need, God has supplied, and it will never run out. I have, I have salvation today based on God's wonderful, amazing, marvelous grace. Grace that forgives and grace that brings us to salvation. Would you bow your heads with me, please?